Hi, I'm Andrew Hilton. This, I'm the director of the CSFI, a small think tank which has now gone virtual. We've done, as you may know, about 50 videos uh, where we have taken some of the issues that we have looked at uh, in the real world and packaged them up into half-hour little little mini videos, and that seems to have worked quite well. We are now moving into the world of webinars. This is the first interactive webinar that we have, uh, have put together, and I'm delighted that we have as our guest for this particular webinar, Jim O'Neill, uh, Baron O'Neill of Gatley in the county of Manchester, probably one of the few Mancunians who made it in the city who didn't go to Manchester Grammar School. Uh, he has been many, many things. Um, he is uh, uh, the inventor of the acronym BRICS, also the inventor of the Next Eleven, the inventor of MINT, and the ex-chairman of Goldman Sachs uh, at Asset Management, a former conservative minister, a PhD from Surrey, uh, what, what can one say? On the board currently of Bruegel, the think tank in Brussels, but also chairman of Chatham House, vice chairman of the Northern Powerhouse <laughs> Partnership, of which he was a progenitor, uh, and also um, many, uh, many things, a member of Shelter Social Housing Commission. This is uh, Manchester's polymath. Uh, in recent weeks, he has been writing on Project Birch. He's been urging the Bank of England to ditch inflation targeting. He's been talking about Temasek as a model for the UK. He wants new regional funds set up in the Middle and Southwest and North. Uh, and he has also been talking about the importance of keeping Chinese investment in infrastructure. It's, uh, it's a huge task that he is setting himself, but uh, we're delighted that he's, uh, he's agreed to come and talk and also to take questions. I think questions will pop up on my screen if you want to ask them. Uh, but if you don't, then I will. And also my colleague, Jane Fuller, is also in on this. So Jane and I will try and invigilate, as it were. But I give you uh, Jim O'Neill, Lord O'Neill, Baron O'Neill of Gatley. Jim, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Andrew. It's uh, a great pleasure um, to join you. And you've obviously you've been doing your homework. And I'm most impressed with uh, your awareness of things that I've been up to. Well, we grew up about four miles apart, actually, on the other side of the Stockport Road. Right. And I didn't go to Manchester Grammar School either. <laughs> yeah. It's something I'm very proud of, the fact that I didn't go to Manchester Grammar School. <laughs> So um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, th I, I was assuming you were just going to start off by quizzing me about something, and we just take it from there. Well, what's what's top of your mind at the moment? Um, I guess there are probably well, as as most days, many things. But I, I guess the 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 two biggies for me are are, are this, what I call the cyclical economic and the structural eco-societal question. Um, if I start with the latter, um, which connects a number of parts of my life, what, what, what has been clear to me since the first few weeks that this pandemic hit Europe is that the, the countries that appear so far uh, to be coping with this um, infection best health-wise are highly correlated with indices uh, that try to measure sustainable economic and inclusive developments. Um, before I became chairman of uh, Goldman Sachs Asset Management, as you know, and probably many of your listeners do, or viewers, um, I was the chief economist before that for uh, over 10 years. And, and during that period, when I created the book acronym, we also set up... Uh, uh, such an index at Goldman Sachs for over 180 countries. And I think they stopped producing it for reasons I'm not entirely sure in 2014. I left in 2013. And uh, on, on that index, um, nine of the top ten uh, happen to be uh, the countries which have got the lowest deaths to population ratio uh, around the world so far from this pandemic. And... Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence. Uh, and, and you take uh, one much discussed example, South Korea. I remember when we very first created the index in the, in the start of the noughties, and South Korea scored 
um, very highly, and I was initially quite surprised. And then when we delved into some of the subcomponents, it was due to their strength in uh, many areas of technology as well as education. And the technological scores, I emphasize, and I think this is highly relevant to the crisis, but also the future, it wasn't because of their technological innovation. It was because of the scale of uh, availability of technologies to their people. And it seems to me that there's a lot of lessons uh, unfolding every week uh, here for us in the UK about the, the, the paucity of our technological availability for all our people. And of course, it's why the test and tracing thing has proved to be so difficult uh, and many other aspects of it too. But I think it probably relates uh, to issues more broadly to do with what I would call more inclusive growth models. Uh, and I think the, the structural lesson from this is that countries uh, and, and perhaps companies are going to have to be thinking a lot more about what I, and I think I've seen you write about it, uh, the stakeholder economy as opposed to the, the obsession with the shareholder economy. Uh, but the, the role of technological availability, I would, I would hope, policy-wise, is something that this government is, is thinking, in all this talk flying around about a summer budget or, a, or an early autumn one, I, I would think doing something about uh, availability of technology for all our people is, should be right up there as a priority. Well, that brings, think, in, yeah. that brings in the first question that I've been asked, which is, uh, what about the threat from Huawei and more, the threat that we will take, kick Huawei, Huawei out of our 5G infrastructure? Can we replace it? Do we have the technological capability? You're suggesting that we, we have fallen behind in technology. I mean, I think the answer is quite clearly no, because if we have, if we have the technological capability, we wouldn't have been in this position in the first place. Um, and it's one of many examples where we, we do need to uh, somehow, I, I, I think in, 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 in for the sake of time, where I'll probably overly simplify it is, is in this particular instance, it's the sort of valley of death uh, type dilemma in, uh, in investing, which is uh, in, in your introduction to me, you talked about these regional investment funds. This is one of the, one of the things that attracts me to that idea is that for, for the whole of my adult lifetime, we, we seem to have this perennial persisting problem that we have plenty of top-class universities in terms of R&D, but translating those into businesses and livelihoods that are relevant for all British citizens seems to be a, a never-ending problem. And I think that's something in parallel to focusing specifically on technologies, something we as a country need to do so much better on it, and hence why uh, the reference to a, a sort of domestic version of a Temasek or, 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 or what one might typically think of as a sovereign wealth fund, where you have the government itself providing more patient equity uh, into such investments. And I, I think it's, this crisis has yet again shown the desperate need for something like that in the UK. So you, you've actually proposed these uh, regional funds. Talk a little bit about what you have proposed. you? So there are, there, are, there are a number of different angles to it, and, and actually uh, I'm glad you've asked me because the, the media coverage of what I've said uh, has been quite uh, um, co contradictory and at times a little bit incorrect. So the, the project Birch that you mentioned, I, I think of, as, of, a, of, of a small part of this is what I'd call a, a traditional sort of bad bank. Um, but if, if I step back and step up, if I go to 40,000 feet and, and where I was right at the start of this crisis, I recall um, the last physical debate I, I was present at in the House of Lords was uh, March the 18th, which was uh, the, the formal response to the budget, which was just a, a week ago, and uh, two days before the Chancellor's big first uh, 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 COVID package. And I call for what I was describing as uh, my, my version of people's QE, which in essence I was calling for not a debt-based uh, approach, but a, a combination of debt grants and, and equity then. Um, 
to essentially uh, cover a two-month period where it was obvious we we're going to have to have a lockdown. This was before lockdown. Uh, and from it, uh, the whole idea of, of using, uh, instead of debt, using equity by the government to help steer uh, more strategic goals. Uh, and so that's really where I was starting from. If you, if you jump forward and, 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 and focus on two other aspects, first of all, the reality is the government chose uh, a debt approach, which I don't think was particularly wise in its wisdom, and that's part of some of the dilemmas we now have today. Uh, and Project Birch is, is seemingly a focus of the Treasury is to consider uh, permanent or, or semi-permanent support for some strategic industries or businesses uh, with, with traditional bad bank type tendencies. And that wasn't something that I have specifically proposed, even though my name is so much associated in the public eye. What I'm really talking about is going back to what I started, is more uh, growth equity or, or substantive uh, government involvement in, in the provision or, or to be the central part of the provision of longer-term growth equity uh, for a whole, a whole slew of different goals, whether it be uh, things to do with net zero emissions or crucially, as it relates to levelling up, and, and, and here I now bring in my own uh, quite active role in the so-called Northern Powerhouse, to deliver uh, the levelling up and regional agenda that this uh, government talks a lot about, but uh, partly because of COVID-19, uh, perhaps hasn't had a chance to do much about yet. And I've, I've been in a lot of discussion with, uh, erratically with various people in Whitehall about this. So, so does the future fund not cut it in terms of help, a, a growth fund helping? Because that's specifically for startups. So the few, exactly. I mean, the future fund is a, is a version of it, but it's very much focused on startups, um, and and it's very designed on businesses. <coughs> if let, let me, Jane, uh, elaborate a bit further in the in the case of the Northern Powerhouse to give you a, a flavour more of what I mean. So. Something called the, uh, the Northern Powerhouse Independent Economic Review, probably, what, four or five years back now, when soon after the notion first got going, uh, conducted a study with the help of some independent consultants on what were uh, the genuine potential world-class assets that the north of England has. And they came up with what they described as four primes. I actually only think three of them are truly uh, unique, and they are alternative energies, uh, advanced manufacturing, and life sciences. And uh, I think they, the other one being digital, which I think is, is, a, is a, bit, a bit of an oddity because everybody in the planet uh, is trying to be good at digital and doesn't, you know, there's not, it's not obvious to me that the North has any greater edge than anybody else, but in the other three, it does. And so if you are a government that wants to be serious about uh, uh, trying to help the North of England develop some new uh, productive capability which provides value-added uh, uh, earnings and living standards and everything that goes with it for people in the North, you would want to support the growth of businesses in those strategic industries which would allow that part of Britain to be world-class. Uh, and that's the essence of what I'm uh, suggesting. So uh, it would be somewhat different than a, a futures fund which is more very traditionally based at... Uh, uh, traditional startup type companies. But you have mentioned Temasek as a, as a model. I mean, do you think it really is a model? I mean, it's a very different society and a very different approach to government in Singapore. I mean, Temasek was just uh, a, an example I deliberately used to say in, in terms of how one might administer it. Uh, you know, because of our history in the UK since the days of Margaret Thatcher, the whole notion of the government being being a smart investor is obviously regarded as somewhat questionable. But, but what, and the, the reason why I gave Temasek as an example, and, and frankly an equal, equally good one, would be actually uh, CDC, which uh, is 100% uh, owned by uh, Department of Trade and Development, uh, is what you do is you set up a body that is arm's length from government and has professional experienced investors on it, but their remit is set and defined by their 100% shareholder, which in this case would be the government. And that, that's what happens with Telesec. So that, that's the analogy. Is this something that uh, we can do post-Brexit that we couldn't do while we're in the European Union? 
Although I realise France has bent the rules a great deal in that area. Uh, I, I don't think this is particularly sensitive to, to, to Brexit. A, a debt version of it is the German uh, uh, post-war development bank, KFW. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think Bre- being in the EU would be a, a barrier to such an organisation. I have got a question here. What might be the role of building new social housing, retrofitting social housing and green infrastructure in ensuring a job-rich green recovery? I think this is a fabulous question and another one of the things I would specifically propose. Uh, The Shelter Housing Commission that you touched on uh, actually came to an end last year and it was only for about 18 months or so, but it was a great pleasure uh, being a commissioner of that uh, uh, I, when I was first asked, I, I jokingly, well, it wasn't jokingly, it was true. I said, I, I don't know anything about housing. What, you know, why do you want me on it? And the answer was, well, we think you might be able to help us think a bit differently. And I, I loved doing it. And it essentially taught me, uh, I, I learned quite a bit. And I, I, two things in particular. First of all, that it seems to me the UK has, not, has simply just not had a strategic policy on housing Ever since, again, Margaret Thatcher, uh, when she decided or presided over the, the privatisation of council houses, it seems to me, uh, with the, all the research and work that Shelter conducted for that and otherwise, and, and what I read from others, essentially the UK has had a series of sticky plaster uh, approaches ever since then. There's been no strategic thinking at all. Uh, and the second thing uh, that I learned linked to that uh, very specifically to social housing, is if you deliberately collapse the, the, the regular supply of, of, of local authority backed housing, then surprise, surprise, you are likely to end up in a problem with supply and demand and prices. Uh, and it seems to me beyond uh, the highly individualistic uh, uh, societal and family nature of, of, of benefits of social housing, there's a, there's a, a, a hugely, uh, equally, possibly more important uh, productivity and macro benefits in that it would help us deal with possibly the persistent uh, cyclical imbalance we have in the uh, UK housing market, again, throughout my, most of my adult life, and actually do something about the, uh, if that were true, it would be something that would enable uh, aspects of the productivity challenge with social mobility, which of course has dogged uh, much of geographic mobility challenges in the UK for the past 30 years or more. Do you think there's any chance that this will happen, that there will be a big social housing programme? I- I've been very surprised and, and disappointed in the things that leak out uh, and get talked about publicly, how little uh, has been said about social housing. And I say disappointed because, of course, this Prime Minister, and more importantly, other than Dominic Cummins, the people that are running Number 10 for him are all people who were with him as the Mayor of London. Uh, and, and Ed Lister in particular, uh, in, in, his, in his role with the housing, uh, housing industry specifically, has a, a, a lot of experience of these kind of issues. And I would have, I would have expected more, but I, I do think it is something they are starting to think, or have started to think more seriously about, uh, just before this crisis started, and so I would hope to think so, yes. I mean, is there is there a chance that because we're going to have to sort of, as it were, rethink economics as a result of the coronavirus, that these initiatives may get more traction within Westminster be- precisely because it's going to have to be the government pushing the economy rather than the private sector? <laughs> Uh, I mean, let's see, Andrew, this, this is, going back to where you started from, this is uh, uh, arguably the, you know, the number one uh, question uh, uh, of, of facing the country today. And I hope it is. I mean, again, you touched on my uh, uh, creation of the BRIC acronym, which uh, I did during, uh, within days of the, of the 9-11 crisis in 2001. And uh, what that taught me uh, about so many aspects of, uh, of of policy and influence, and just thinking that how how one one being an individual or a company, or in this case particularly a government, thinks objectively during the crisis, essentially uh, drives the next era. And uh, as you just pointed out, 
uh, the government happens to now have the destiny of so many sways of our economic and, and social structure in a way that they wouldn't have thought and probably certainly wouldn't have wanted six months ago. And in the spirit of never letting a crisis go to waste, why not? Uh, and it seems to me, and I occasionally wonder whether whether parts of the equity market's performance and, and the apparent surprising strength is reflecting on the fact that markets often often being capable of thinking better than any of us that talk about them are, are starting to think may, maybe some some good might come out of this disastrous mess that we're in. Uh, and certainly, in my view, the government has a huge opportunity to do so. So, and if we're serious about net zero emissions, this crisis gives the government an enormous opportunity uh, to, to to really guide uh, business and society in a way to actually meet it. Very interesting news from BP in that regard just today, of course. So, so does that mean there should be green strings attached to? Uh, government-backed loans or indeed the equity stakes you've talked about? I, I would definitely. Certainly, certainly if this Project Birch thing is indeed just focused on on debt for uh, uh, the way it seems to be being briefed or leaked out is, is in terms of uh, large employing companies, many of which happen to be uh, carbon-polluting ones, I, I would think it should be hugely conditional uh, on them being much more serious about net zero emissions. Can I ask, can I shift the, the discussion slightly? You've also said that the Bank of England should ditch its inflation target in favour of a nominal GDP target. Could you just talk a little bit about what you see central bank policy ought to be at the present time? Yeah, um, thank you. You know, I've been, in the past couple of days, I've been, I've been, uh, I've been trying to debate with myself this is something I first started to make noises about five or six weeks ago. Uh, I, I've started to debate with myself whether whether, whether I'm being a little bit uh, pernickety. Um, obviously, the the whole the whole purpose of a of a nominal GDP target as opposed to an inflation target is that the bank is forced to give a is is, is forced to follow a broader remit. And the reason why I say perhaps I'm being a bit pernickety, if you look at uh, the actions so far of the bank, and, and actually also what Andrew Bailey was, at least what I saw quoted saying uh, uh, late last week after the uh, the news of an estimated 20 plus percent GDP hit in April, to some degree the bank is thinking in those terms anyhow. Um, so with that caveat, my, 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 my intention or, or purpose is, is kind of threefold. First of all, it seems to me and, and linking it to what we we're just discussing, one has to think of the circumstances in, of society in which a crisis has hit. And it seemed to me that uh, whilst inflation targeting, when introduced in the UK, as in a number of other countries, uh, was a fantastic positive development, it, it's kind of lost its its way uh, in that uh, for various. Uh, structural reasons globally, but also some domestically. Uh, you know, the bank the bank has generally had a problem um, positioning itself around what is the real meaning of this inflation target. Inflation hasn't really been an issue for a good decade plus. So, what is the point of the bank focusing everything to do with an inflation target when, uh, if anything, the struggle is to actually get get up to the level of the target? Uh, and, and secondly, and, and, and the more important point than just that very important technical one, is that the last decade post uh, 2008 financial crisis, of course, we've had these enormous uh, increases in financial asset prices, uh, which has been a result of the bank's QE as well as other developments, uh, and some of the practices of balance sheet management in the financial sector. Uh, and surprise, surprise, uh, both the actual actuality and, and more so uh, intensified irritations and perceptions about inequality. Uh, and of course, the bank often put, holds its hands up and says it's got nothing to do with them. But I, I, th I think actually the narrow inflation mandated target does because it forces the bank, if you've got just that as a target, it's forced the bank 
to do whatever it can just to get that, that, that number to where it's supposed to be, which is almost definitely, along with other central banks, played a role in the asset price uh, inflation relative to other things in life. And so what about a, a nominal GDP target? Is that the right target for, for, for a central bank, or, or is, it, is it more complex than that? Is it? So that brings me to the third reason. The third reason why I say it is, of course, we're having this, we're going through this colossal collapse of, of GDP during this crisis. Who knows where we will end up this year? But uh, it, it, one way of, of boosting the probability of a V shaped recovery would be for this government to give uh, our central bank a nominal GDP target, and, and particularly in the first years, an especially high one. Uh, if, uh, if for the sake of it, uh, uh, the consensus view is that nominal GDP is going to drop, I don't know, let's say for the sake of it, 10% this year, mm -hmm. uh, you could set up such a target, and this is the first piece I wrote on it, where, where over, over time the nominal GDP target would be something what you would assume to be close to trend let's say 4 to 5% for nominal GDP, but in the first year, you would give them a target of, uh, of 10 or 11%, which, of course, wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily guarantee a V-shaped recovery, but it would certainly uh, increase the probability, in my view. And then the, the additional benefit, I think it could act as, a, as its own independent arbiter uh, on the governments of the day as to when to decide to tighten or not fiscal policy rather than just sort of flaying around in, in, with a finger in the air based on how it feels, which has to be another major dilemma coming out of this crisis. Obviously, at some point, uh, there may be needed measures to restrict uh, government spending and raise taxes. But unless you have some kind of nominal GDP target, how do you know the right point to start thinking about doing that? Can I just broaden that slightly? I mean... It's beginning to sound a little bit as though it's sort of modern monetary theory by exception or modern monetary theory by another name. What do you feel about MMT? I mean, I see that last week the New York Times actually yeah. listened to Shelton, uh, have a column and Paul Krugman responded to it. And it was a very interesting 15 round heavyweight battle. Um, yeah. Where do you stand? So well, obviously, um, as you just picked up on, as, as a sort of temporary policy to deal with this crisis. Uh, I do have some sympathy for the flavour of it, and I certainly think, uh, and again, you can't ignore the circumstances in which this crisis has happened. When you are forcing the whole of your society to stop behaving as they've been educated to do for all their lives and their parents' lives, you as the government have a pretty strong obligation to do whatever you can with the power of the government's balance sheet when the moment is right to try and get their lives, uh, let's call it rewarded, for doing what the government of the day has asked them to do. And, and that part of it, which is the broader philosophical uh, aspect of MMT, it seems to me, I, I have some sympathy with. Where I, where I diverge, hence, hence uh, under nominal GDP targeting, I would have a, a very uh, ambitious number in year one, uh, but then have something closer to, uh, to what an independent economist might think as trend, uh, I, I think the idea of just con you know, having no limits on how much money gets spent in the foreseeable future uh, is, a, is, a, is a highly risky uh, and unproven path to go down. And, it, and it, I, it, I wouldn't say it, it doesn't scare me, but I think there's parts of it that are pretty risky for a government to embrace. Okay, going back, there's a question here, going back to the, the GDP target. A uh, question for Jim, how practical is a GDP target given, one, how far information about GDP, how long information about GDP lags, much worse data even than CPI data, that the Bank of England has no tools to target real GDP, only the inflation component of GDP, and it cannot affect productivity or population growth. So uh, I would say that question is, uh, is reasonably 
typical of the historical challenges to nominal GDP targeting. Uh, and there is some conceptual validity, but uh, the reason why I um, personally think away from the specifics of why I've said it, some of these things are no longer true is because of the, again, the remarkable advent of technology and data. Um, we already know uh, estimates for March and April's GDP, uh, and yes, they've come with, with a, a short lag from the CPI data, but this, this idea that, that was, was much more valid 15 years ago when the likes of Sam Britton and many others used to talk about nominal GDP targeting, is that we, it, we, it was a huge lag before we even knew what had happened with GDP. Uh, uh, if I go further, if you look, you, you look at the capabilities with data, you have many, uh, well, many, a number of firms that now undertake so-called now casting, where you can essentially forecast weekly GDP. Uh, and of course, there are inaccuracies with some of those data point and estimates. But I, I think that those kind of traditional historic uh, challenges are just no longer really valid. Uh, uh, I, I remember even going back seven, eight years uh, to my latter days at Goldman, we were pretty strongly of the opinion that uh, the initial monthly um, PMI uh, estimates were actually more accurate than, than the, the, the GDP estimate that came out three months later. Uh, and it wasn't until you get the revisions to the GDP numbers two years later that they were actually closer to what the initial PMI estimate said. So. I don't think these traditional historic uh, reasons are, are nowhere near as valid as they once were. Yeah, I think this is an amazing, this is a sort of debate that's going on under the surface in the economics profession. But all the data that we tend to look at, the US, uh, the US non-farm payrolls data being probably the best, but it still is lagging a month, whereas MasterCard puts out this stuff every, every few days. I mean, the real-time economic data ought to make conventional economics and conventional economic analysis utterly and completely redundant. Well, I, don't, you know, I know, I'm pretty sure, if I think back to the kind of proprietary models that I got some of our uh, PhD geniuses in my, in my golden days, you know, we had our own proprietary advanced leading indicator and I talked about the, the sustainable development indicator. If you took some of the statistics that are rolled out but are available related to these kind of businesses and companies, I'm pretty sure you could almost do a daily GDP indicator. Okay, can I just move on? You, you've written quite a lot about China and emerging markets, but uh, particularly I think this, this idea of Chinese invo involvement in your your plans for a major in infrastructure investment program. I mean, how do you feel about that at the present time? I mean, there is obviously a much more fragile relationship between China and the West at the present time. And in expanding from that, your, your views on globalization. So I, 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 I was in a, um, a debate with um, a Tory MP on uh, the week in Westminster that was aired on uh, Saturday morning about the China issue. You know, it seems to me that there's, there's, two, there's two aspects of it um, I'll initially comment on in terms of where we are. I, I think that possibly for understandable reasons linked to the, you know, being in the middle of this crisis, the government is, is struggling to think strategically about so much. And its stance on China epitomizes so much else. It sort of gets driven by the populist mood, uh, seemingly quite often by the right, uh, right wing of its own party. And, and this sort of anti-China thing, which has uh, escalated dramatically inside the Tory party, which appears based again on leaks uh, to be starting to influence uh, policy that we'll see evidence of in coming days and weeks, I suspect, it's just not, it's not particularly rational. Um, and the second thing to say to that is, you know, if we're trying to, we're trying to define uh, post-Brexit global Britain, uh, are, are we, how are we trying to do it? Are we trying to do it based on uh, some sort of fanciful notion of Britain's Commonwealth history, which, by the way, as soon as you do that, you run into problems that we see in another part of 
uh, of life's current debates with statues being torn down all over the place? Or do you do it on some rational uh, anchor related to economics? And, and, and I, I, I personally think uh, in the very earliest weeks of, of, uh, of this government, they, they showed signs, at least on China, as, as, as going down the right path. Uh, under enormous pressure from Washington, uh, the decision this government made about Huawei struck me as being pretty sensible. And by the way, uh, based on, uh, as ended up becoming public for many of them, the, the expert independent views of our security experts. And I know from my own brief time as a minister, because I was involved in policy related to China, I would get a security briefing about China. And a lot of the people that are pine about issues to do with this on Huawei will, will definitely not have any access to that. So on what basis they are coming up with these opinions, I, I have no idea other than some sort of traditional sentiment that we don't like communist countries, which, which is fine. But if, if that's the stance you're going to take, or and we don't like countries with bad record and bad practices on, on human rights, which is also fine. But if you're going to do that, you've got to be consistent. And as I said in the, this program on Saturday, how on earth can we have this kind of stance towards China when we openly uh, tolerate completely different way of relationship with the likes of Saudi Arabia, for example? Hmm. You know, it's just seen as completely hypocritical by some of those countries. And in this case, we're dealing with a country that for the past decade has been and even bigger to global uh, marginal contributors in global consumption than the United States. So, you know, do we, want, do we want to be serious about exploring new trade relationships and opportunities post-Brexit or not? I mean, because if you're going to end up having a poor, a, a, a less efficient trade relationship with the EU and in deliberately impairing your one with China, you are essentially looking at having better relationships with uh, the ex uh, or the Anglo-Saxon world. And of those, the only one that really matters is the United States. And so it, it's sort of, it's very poorly thought out. Uh, and, but I think, it, unfortunately, it reflects this sort of bizarre emotion-based thinking that seems to dominate the Conservative Party, which when you, when you stand back and look at it, you know, we have been governed by leaders from the same political party for now for nearly 11 years, and there's no stability in their strategic thinking at all about some of these issues. What about globalisation? You, you have been a, a strong advocate of it in the past, but it is clearly, I mean, clearly in retreat. How far it will retreat, I guess, is a matter for discussion. Well, can I, I'll, I'll play devil's advocate here. Is it, is it clearly in retreat? <coughs> Global trade is obviously uh, currently going a massive decline, but that's because there is uh, the most severe contraction of GDP that has ever been uh, for probably 100 years. Um, I think you will only be able to really tell whether globalization, if you use uh, the percentage change in global trade as, as the measure, you only really be able to tell that uh, over over a period of cycles where the economy recovers from this crisis as well. Um, and the second thing I would say is clearly the role of China in the global supply chain is under threat, uh, and it was in any case before this crisis. But the idea that globalization itself is vanishing or reducing I think is also conceptually questionable. If you look at what's going, just this discussion we're doing now, you, you, you yourself uh, highlighted uh, this being the first event of this nature and all the videos you are now doing as part of uh, permanent life. Uh, I, would, I would imagine you can get people uh, joining your events from around the world, which ordinarily, pre-COVID, you wouldn't have been able to. Uh, is that not a form of increased globalization? Um, if you look at the extraordinary things going on in the pharmaceutical industry uh, and uh, between pharmaceutical companies and between them and biotech firms, 
And here I have some experience because of the work uh, I did on the, the review in antimicrobial resistance. I, I wouldn't have dreamt that six months after the in, onset of this crisis that these firms would be doing the kind of cooperative things they're doing around the world. I literally wouldn't have dreamt. And so, yes, some, some forms of how globalization has persisted uh, or, or advanced in the past 20 years might be under threat. But the idea that globalization in itself is under threat, I, I don't really think is, is at all really a credible idea. Uh, reshoring? You don't un know. Ultimate. Uh, let, let's go to reshoring. I mean, if it, reshoring is a very catchy political phrase, but at the end of the day, without getting too uh, overly nerdy as an economist about it, if countries run uh, imbalances between their domestic savings and investment requirements, that means they have to attract uh, investment from overseas or they have to provide investment overseas to others. Uh, another way of saying, reshoring could only work if every country had a balance of payments equaling uh, zero on both its current account and capital account. And in the United States, where uh, for most of my adult life, again, they've had a persistent low savings rate, which has required foreign capital inflow, by definition, it means they import more than they export. And they can make song and dance about doing nothing, importing nothing from China for the whole rest of the future, but the idea that that automatically brings stuff back to the States is complete nonsense, unless the US deliberately raises its savings rate. It will just mean they import something from somewhere else. Okay, let me just come back. There's a question here which is very specific. Can HMG ignore the issue of Hong Kong? Will Hong Kong survive as a financial centre? You've been generally more positive, I think, about China's world role than, shall we say, some Tory politicians. How do you feel about our response to the Hong Kong problem? So, I, I have contradictory views about it. Um, I mean, speaking coldly, um, as soon as the, the, the handover was agreed in, uh, what, what, let me get my, uh, was it 97 or 94? I, keep, I always get my years wrong. Uh, when it, whichever it was the two. Um, that was the end of the peak of Hong Kong. Um, because however you wanted to put gloss on it, um, that meant from then onwards, Hong Kong was more part of China than it was before. And uh, again, I emphasize I'm looking at it very coldly. Uh, as we get closer to the end of that 50-year period, uh, the more likely it is that China wants Hong Kong to be more like the rest of China. Um, it's not that surprising. And so um, recent events certainly uh, accelerate uh, Hong Kong becoming more like the rest of China, whatever China ends up being like, which, by the way, I'm not sure any of us really know. Um, and so in that sense, I, I think... And it's tricky because I, I think, and here's my contradictory part, I, I think in hindsight, and hence partly of the, here the Tory offer about uh, offering potential immigration is more, is more understandable. That's probably something that the UK should have done 20-odd um, years ago. Uh, and, and this unfortunate style how the Chinese have announced this development uh, is bringing that uh, recognition out in the UK. But the idea that, that, that China's sort of doing something that it didn't agree to is an issue that should have been thought about a lot more in the 1990s before we signed the deal than being able to materially do anything about now. I mean, are we seriously thinking that in, 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 in 2000, I think it's four, 2049 is the end of the period, right? Are we seriously thinking that a year before we're going to be able to influence China on what it wants to do with Hong Kong? Hmm. I mean, I, I just think it's a bit, it, you know, it's, it's, it's understandable because we, we were obligated and we're 
presiding over Hong Kong, but we should have been more careful and thoughtful about it before we signed the handover notes, rather than thinking we can do anything now. So HSBC and Standard Chartered are right to uh, uh, plump for Beijing over Hong Kong, really, in terms of signing the letter um, supporting the Beijing position. Well, <laughs> without trying to be a, di a diplomat, I mean, what I, what I would say is those two firms uh, are greatly involved in the print printing of Hong Kong dollars. Uh, and so, you know, it's e again, it's easy for people here in the UK to sort of just loosely opine on what the rights and wrongs of, the, of those two institutions might be doing. But these guys have an enormous amount of commercial exposure to all of this, and they have to be really careful. Jane, do you want to come in? Um, you have um, some questions yourself. I, one thing is, um, just going back to the sort of northern powerhouse, um, yeah. A couple of issues. One is um, uh, infrastructure. There's this argument about do we go for what's shovel ready? And I suppose, um, I don't know if it's either or, or do we go for what you actually need in terms of infrastructure for the North? And just one other thing I hope you'll touch on for the end, which is um, uh, skills, this idea of um, that, that we really need to improve the skills base. But I don't know, Andrew, whether there's some other questions as well you wanted to bring in. Well, let, let, let's answer those. Let, Jim. So, um, um, I love how you, you great questions and re really, really hardcore serious. The, the key things you bring out here, and this is this is a hugely important thing. You know, I, I've often uh, said since I uh, got so immersed in the Northern Powerhouse, there are six ingredients to ultimately deliver its success: uh, devolution of powers, uh, physical infrastructure, education, skills more business, business engagements, and greater uh, local accountability and ambition. And uh, I, when pushed, I always argued uh, if you had to pick relative importance of those, education and skills were the, probably the two most important. And what I would certainly say uh, as we go through COVID-19, I think the relative balance of these different forms of needs has shifted even more that way. Um, you know, a, a major dilemma for policymakers to think through uh, with, with the experience of COVID-19 and, and, and maybe some of the long-term consequences. Do we need the same kind of physical infrastructures in, in the way we might have thought about just a year ago, even though these are things for 20 years in the future? Is, is it going to be the case that we need, uh, for example, uh, a third railway at Heathrow. Uh, arguably not. Uh, do we need HS2? Do HS2, which is prior, I, I think it, in, in spirit, is, is essentially thought of as trying to get business people uh, to move around a lot more efficiently and quickly. Are we going to have the need for such capacity when a lot of large firms are probably thinking of permanently having a, a percentage of their people no longer ever being in an office. Uh, you know, I don't dismiss the possibility that once we get a vaccine, we'll all forget about such things and it returns to life as normal. And well, maybe it won't. But what is what is clear, and as you can see in other parts of the world, you can put in whatever fancy train system you want. But unless you have uh, the right educated and motivated people with the right skills, none of this physical infrastructure is going to work. So uh, the education and skills requirements for delivering on the Northern Powerhouse. So I what are the skills? It's fine to talk about skills in the abstract, but specifically, what are the skills that will help levelling up, will help the North to develop and the South West to develop for that matter? Yeah. So I, 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 I would say... I said education and school. The key thing which is the most easy to identify is to have the education attainments. Uh, I'm more, I'm here, I'm very familiar with it across the North and I'm, I'm deeply immersed in this from a Northern Powerhouse perspective as I am from a, a, a Shine educational charity perspective too. We have many, many pockets of uh, the Northern economy and, and parts of the Midlands which have extremely uh, weak 
educational attainment. Uh, and if you don't change that, then you don't you don't have the the mental wherewithal to develop the skills capability, whatever those skills may be. Uh, and we need we need to have much more serious policy initiatives on those. The government, this government, uh, going back, uh, I think it was to the coalition, maybe or certainly, the, if not the early days of Cameron, uh, set up something called opportunity areas. Blackpool being uh, one of the initial ones and one of the few in the north. They, these should be much more serious. Uh, uh, areas of where there is a whole host of related uh, support measures and interventions done to change uh, a generational cycle of, of uh, educational attainment and aspiration and skills opportunity. And I say all of that because I don't the answer is to what skills. The answer is nobody knows what, what specific industries are going to be the winners of the future. But you need to make sure that you have coming out of the education system the adaptability and capability that we see in so many parts of London and the South East is just only too natural, but you do not get in many other parts of England. This is primary and secondary education then rather than tertiary education? I, I think, no, it is, it, it is especially primary and secondary, but it is also tertiary. I am a, uh, a strong believer of, um, of, of, of improving... Uh, the capability of further education colleges uh, instead of universities. I think as much as I, uh, I'm a huge supporter of having uh, university education for more people, I, I think we have, in the rush, following the Blair goal of 50% to be in universities by 2020, which essentially we've achieved, it's been done too quickly to the detriment of uh, aspects of universities uh, and to the great uh, destruction of further education colleges where, where you do get specific skills training, of course. And that needs to be reversed. We have a question here which takes uh, the discussion back, but it's probably worth asking. Is policy during the uh, coronavirus weakening the Bank of England's independence? A, does it matter? B, is it a good thing? C, should it be transparent? Um, I'm not sure if it's weakening the Bank of England's independence. Um, you know, I'm in the camp that, um, which partly links to why I'm thinking about the remit change. The central bank can't be uh, socially independent. It can be operationally independent. Uh, and I think the bank, by and large, has, has had a pretty good crisis so far. But its remit... Uh, needs to be given by the elected governments of the day, representing the needs and interests of our people. Uh, and if, if the question is implying, you know, should the bank try and resist that? I think the answer is no. Uh, you know, the bank, the bank is operationally independent, but its remit should and is given by the elected government of the day. Okay, we've got five minutes left, and maybe a couple of questions will pop up. But let me just ask you generally, you look at the, the global economy, because we focus primarily on the UK, look at the yeah. global economy, what are the big threats coming out of the coronavirus? Because I assume that we are at least yeah. over the next month or so going to be coming out of it. What do you see as the major threats facing the global economy? I would say, well, there's many, but I would say three. And, and let me cover it by saying... Uh, I tend to be a little bit more hopeful about uh, the global economy than, is, than I read and hear many others saying. But the three threats are, first of all, again, uh, the, the timing and circumstances. Clearly, we're, we're stuck in this vacuum in, 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 in time with, with China now becoming very important, but none of us really understand the place that well. And none of us really know where it's going to ultimately land, if it's going to land. And at the same time, the US seemingly losing its interest in global matters. And so the first problem we've got is modern global institutions, post-war institutions, generally speaking, aren't really fit for purpose. And as we can see in this crisis, the, the, the absence of proper international coordination is a, is a worrying contrast to 2008. And that's something that really bothers me considerably. 
what are you specifically, where are the specific holes in the international framework that you see? So, for example, so the IMF should have been given an SDR increase in its allocation, but the US blocked it. Didn't, didn't even really get discussed because everybody knew the, IMF, the US would block it. There was a specific plan for a, a G20 health minister's declaration and, and monies to do with uh, vaccine acceleration. Again, the US blocked it because of their hostility to China. And now it's having to be led by the Wellcome Trust, which is wonderful for them, but it's, it, 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 it diminishes its purpose. Uh, the whole issue surrounding the WHO, the whole issue surrounding the WTO, and on and on and on. Uh, all these institutions are in, a, in some sort of uh, existential crisis, it seems to me. Um, and so there's a whole set of issues to do with that. Uh, which the likes of your uh, uh, organisation and Chatham House that I chair need, need to think a lot about trying to do something about and helping improve. Second thing I would say linked to it, I think this crisis is, 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 is uh, a real issue for Anglo-Saxon economies, particularly the United States. It has demonstrated some serious flaws in the shareholder obsession uh, culture. And I, I would like to see that from this, uh, we, we have uh, a shift to a, 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 a more stakeholder economy where the role of share buybacks and balance sheet management becomes much less dominant. And we, we, we have a business world that focuses on optimizing various goals as opposed to obsessing about maximizing one. And if we don't, I worry that things like MMT and uh, much more radical socialism is going to follow. And then capitalism would be under more permanent threat. We have an opportunity here for capitalism to get back to being a bit more what's supposed to be on the tin. But I worry uh, that it won't. And, and what happens in the States is crucial as to how that plays out. Uh, and then the, the, the third issue is, of course, um, are we going to reprice what are often described as, uh, as, as market failures, uh, which arguably uh, coronavirus is a, is, a, is a sort of strange but classic example. Antibiotic resistance, something I'm deeply immersed in. Uh, the amount of money that's needed to solve uh, antibiotic resistance is, is, is tiny compared to what we're seeing in this crisis. Yet, yeah. uh, Have we got policymakers that are going to learn from this crisis to do more about it? Climate change and so on. And it, arguably, it's the same part, it's, a, it's an angle of the second point. Well, look, we've now spent exactly an hour, and I'm delighted that we've covered a huge amount of ground. Um, a final question, perhaps, from Jane. Jane, do you have a, a, a point that you'd like to make on this? Um, I, su I suppose um, you've talked a lot about policy, um, mm -hmm. and very illuminatingly. Um, what's sort of missing from this is a sense of, um, from the grassroots, what's going to push upwards. You know, small private businesses, do they really want to take on much more debt, let alone have a government with a stake in them? Or is it simply a question of, like, the furlough scheme, it would be better off just to give them, you know, make grants or manage debt forgiveness and, if necessary, recapitalise banks and just let, so that, you know, the grassroots can flourish without this more of this sort of top-down approach which seems to be sort of what you described oh i think it'd be i mean i think the reality is given where we are where we are jane right i mean mm -hmm. because there's been so much the, the debt instruments has been used so much to get us where we are it's difficult to roll back the clock but one of the reasons why i'm so interested in a lot of these debt to equity conversion type ideas is partly linked to what you're saying uh, I love on a local level, where I'm sure many people on this call may have involvement in them or certainly aware of them, but where you have your, your, your favourite local restaurant where you visit six times a year, people are, are committing in advance uh, payments for the next two years to keep these places uh, having a future. Uh, and I love that whole genuine bottoms-up spirit uh, being driven, um, which which I, I, I also, going back to what I said, I, you know, that's part of what I was calling on at the start, but the government didn't go that path and we are where we are. So 
Oh, God, that brings up the whole issue of regional stock exchanges, all sorts of things that we've been looking at for 20 years. There you go. Well, you should keep pushing on them. You should keep pushing on them. Look, can I thank Jim? Can I really thank you? I thought that was terrific. Can I thank all of you who have been watching? Can I thank you for your questions? And we'll have this up as a video, as a video, I hope, by close of business today. But thank you all very much.